Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Back to School Strategies to Prepare for School Routines. This webinar is part one of a two-part series related to back to school and you can stay tuned for more information about how to register for the second webinar, Strategies for Connecting with Your School Team. My name is Bethany Bruin and I'm an occupational therapist by background and I'm also part of our subject matter expert team here at Autism Ontario. Today, I'm joined by my colleague, Kristen Gumby, who is a behavior analyst and also part of our subject matter expert team. Before we get started, we have a few minor housekeeping details we would like to review. So first of all, please feel free to enter your questions in the Q&A function directly below this um, box on your screen, and we will have some time to answer your questions at the end of the presentation. We also wanted to review our use of language during this presentation and to respect the preferences for both person first and identity first language, we'll be using those terms interchangeably throughout this webinar. We also wanted to note that the opinions reflected in this workshop are those of the speaker and presenter and don't necessarily reflect Autism Ontario's views. And we would like to endorse your right to information and encourage you to do your own research and make your own decisions. Also a reminder that during this presentation, we can't answer specific questions pertaining to your individual child or an individual you know, um, but we'll be happy to answer any general questions you have, again, at the Q&A section at the end of this presentation. So just to give a bit of an overview of what we'll be talking about today, we are hoping today that we can support you in learning some simple strategies you can practice with your child in the days leading up to the start of school. What we hope you'll take away from this webinar includes identifying routines you can implement at home to help your child make a smooth transition to school, as well as learning to use some creativity and planning to practice some school-related skills and activities. The agenda for what we'll be looking at today is first we'll be outlining a framework for teaching skills. Next, we'll outline some examples of routines and skills you can focus on at home, such as a morning or bedtime routine. And finally, we'll provide some resources for social opportunities, both leading up to school and as your child starts school. So now I'll over to Kristen to help us get started. Thanks, Bethany. So when we think about getting ready for school, there's so many skills we might want to teach, but we may not actually know how to teach them. So we thought we'd start out by outlining some of the things that you can do to help your child learn a skill so that when you choose the skill that you want to teach, whether it's writing their name, packing a backpack, or learning to attend when you call their name, you have an idea of some of the things that you can do to help your child achieve those targets. I'm going to go through some elements of teaching that come from the field of applied behavior analysis. We'll talk about deciding what to teach, how to break the skill down, how to help your child as needed, how to acknowledge their efforts, and then how to measure progress. And then later in this webinar, we'll zoom in on some helpful routines and skills for school that you may wanna teach using this framework. First thing you wanna do is determine what it is you wanna teach. A target skill is something that we hope to achieve. And we wanna be careful to choose a target skill that's gonna benefit our children either indirectly or directly. So for example, if your child likes their food warm and you plan on packing a thermos, that food in the thermos, it would make sense to look at the skills needed to open and close a the thermos. A target skill can be short and sweet, like opening a lid, or involve a number of different skills chained together, such as brushing your teeth, where you might open a lid, squeeze out the toothpaste, or wet your toothbrush. You can decide on your target skill when you've identified that the skill will benefit your child, and when you observe that they don't yet have the skill. So in the case of the thermos, you might wonder whether it's or not your child can open or close a the thermos. So you might give them the thermos and ask them to open it, ask them to close it, and just take note with a pencil and paper to see what they can and can't do. If your child can't do the skill and you know that it'll benefit them, those are indicators that that would be a good place to start teaching. When we decide on our target skill, we wanna write it down in a way that's observable and measurable. And this will make more sense when we talk about data collection, but we want enough details so that when we begin to measure our school-related skills by collecting data, different people can agree on whether the skill has been achieved or not. Then we wanna take our skill, and if the skill is not short and sweet, we wanna break it down into smaller, more manageable components. So imagine being asked to play a board game without any instructions or make a specific food dish without a recipe. 
there are many tasks that involve a number of little steps along the way. So we want to identify what those little steps are, and this list would be called the task analysis. If we take a skill like putting on pants or brushing teeth, and we watch someone complete the task, we can start to notice and write down all the little steps involved. By doing this, we can help our children by teaching little parts at a time and not overwhelming them with the entire list in one go. There are three different ways to develop a task analysis. You can do the task yourself or watch someone else complete the skill and you can record all the different behaviors that are involved in those. Or you can ask an expert like a BCBA or an occupational therapist or a speech and language pathologist. They might have lists available to you. Then you can test the task analysis by trying those written steps out and seeing whether there were any steps that were missed or if there's anything that you want to change around. Like some people enjoy wetting their toothbrush and some don't. While we teach these steps, we may need to use prompting. Prompting involves providing extra assistance to your child to complete a skill. Some common prompts may include gestural prompts for children who can follow a point where you might point to something they need to get or point to something they need to do. Or for children who can imitate or copy others, you may use a model prompt where you show them how to do something and then ask them to do it. And for other children, you may use physical prompts if they'll allow you to use physical touch. You may physically guide them to complete the task. You can start with no prompts and increase your assistant as, as needed. This is called least to most prompting for children who learn skills quickly or for children who already display the skill sometimes. Or you can start with the prompt your child needs to complete the skill and then assess along the way whether you can reduce your prompts. That's called most to least prompts for children who need more support or for or more time to learn a skill. If you're interested in looking at what these prompts look like um, within the context of learning a skill, Can Our Child and Family Services has a video on least to most prompting and it's available, the link is available in our resources. And once you've had a chance to look at prompting examples, you may wanna write out some prompts that you think might work best for your child and think about how and when you'll use those prompts. And then whatever prompting plan you decide to use, you wanna make a plan to reduce your prompts gradually by decreasing the assistance they need over time and encouraging independence. While your child is working hard on the target skill, we wanna make sure that we acknowledge their efforts. We use something called positive reinforcement where we give the child something they enjoy and value after they've demonstrated their hard work and effort on a skill. Using positive reinforcement can increase the likelihood that they'll display that same desirable skill in the future under similar conditions. How this works is first you identify your child's unique preferences. For some children, they may enjoy praise and tickles. For others, it might be time with a toy or a magazine or some screen time. You might be able to ask them ahead of time to choose an item or activity from an array or you might be able to observe them from watching and seeing what types of things they engage with more than others. And then you want to make sure that you keep that item or activity special and it's delivered mostly for displaying the target skill. So you may want to limit access to the special item outside of working on the skill, especially if your child is someone who gets tired of things easily. After your child displays the target skill, you want to provide them with that preferred item or activity right away. You may wish to give smaller amounts of that reinforcer for attempts at the target skill and give larger amounts when the skill is displayed independently. If the child doesn't display the skill at all or attempt the skill, we want to hold back on giving that preferred item or activity so that we don't confuse them. Also, it's important to remember that preferences change over time and some change from moment to moment. So try and reassess and re-identify preferences on a regular basis. Once we have our task analysis, we want to use and the preferred items or activities ready. We can use chaining where we teach the target skill that's comprised of all those little individual responses. There's three different types of chaining that are commonly used. The first one is total task chaining, where we work on all the steps that your child um, needs to learn from start to end. This is what we typically use when we follow a recipe or we play a board game. Now, for some individuals, that might be too much and too overwhelming. So you might want to use forward chaining, where you teach your child to initially complete only the first step in that task analysis, and then you would provide some positive reinforcement. And once they can demonstrate that first step independently, then you can move to teaching them the first and the second and so on and so on. So the first, the second, and the third until they have all the steps in that chain. 
Backward chaining is the same idea as forward chaining, except you start from the last step in the task analysis. So this means you help your child through the initial steps, either by helping them or prompting them through it or doing it for them. And then you fade your prompts with a last step only. So you're only expecting some independence on that last step. And once they can demonstrate that last step with competence and independence, then you would ask them to do the second last and the last step and so on. So then the third last, the second last and the last step until they have all the um, responses in the chain. And finally, we monitor progress using data collection. So this is the process of gathering information and measuring how things are going with our strategies and target skills. It helps us evaluate whether we're on the right track or whether something needs to be changed. Data also helps us know when and how much positive reinforcement to deliver and when and how much assistance or prompting to use. So let's take a look at how this is done. There's a data sheet with a target behavior, a prompting hierarchy, and a task analysis. And we'll have some task analysis and data sheets like this available to you in the resource section. We will also have some blank ones available for you so that you can fill out your own unique um, task analysis and prompting hierarchy. So if you look at the top, you'll see that you have um, the target skill packing a backpack, where it says load all contents into the backpack and close the backpack. And then it's outlined, we've outlined the positive reinforcement. So the child will get two minutes of tag when they complete steps one to five independently. And we'll just verbally acknowledge attempts if the prompts are required. Next, we have a prompting hierarchy. So listed um, one to five. And then horizontally, we have those numbers one to five that correspond with the prompting hierarchy. So if we were to take a look at how to collect data on this, You'll see for unzipping the backpack and leaving it open, you can check whether that was independent for this child. Um, the example is that they were able to do that independently. The next and the third step independently. And then the fourth step independently. The fifth step, um, maybe we increased and we used a model prompt and that wasn't enough to help them. And so then we had to go in with a gestural prompt and that's okay, but that just means that we verbally acknowledge them but we're not yet playing that two minutes of tag. It's something that's really easy so that if the child did show that they were motivated to play that two minutes of tag, you could just unload those three contents, have them try again, and hopefully um, they can access that positive reinforcement next. So let's take a look at what this looks like all together. First, you'd have your target skill and you would cue your child to complete that target skill, like pack your backpack. Next, you're going to break the skills down if it's not a short and sweet skill into smaller, more manageable components. And then you're going to decide on how you're going to teach that. So either total task presentation um, for chaining, forward chaining or backward chaining. Next, we're going to prompt them as needed using a prompt that works for your child. And then we're going to acknowledge their efforts with positive reinforcement. And lastly, Practice, 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 because repetition is key and it provides opportunities to improve and learn and it trains our brains to respond to the environment in new um, ways that hopefully serve us better. Lastly, I wanted to talk about generalization. So generalization is the ability for a child to perform a skill under different conditions. So in the case of learning to pack a backpack, this would mean teaching your child to respond to different people. So um, not just caregivers at home, but maybe a teacher at school. It would involve learning to pack a backpack in various settings. So can you pack your backpack from home to school and school to home? Can you pack your backpack to go to the pool or to go for a sleepover? And with various materials. So not just packing the contents of a backpack to go to school, but can they pack it for swim class? Can they pack a backpack for a sleepover with different contents involved? Keep in mind what the end goal is and if there's anything you can do to make your child more successful in getting there. Generalization is what we need to see before we consider a skill mastered. Next, we're going to discuss some routines and skills that may be helpful to focus on in the days and weeks leading to the start of school. So keep in mind the framework for teaching and the generalization pieces as you hear some potential targets that you may want to teach. Thanks, Kristen. So just a reminder, we're coming up to about halfway through our presentation right now. And if you do have any questions about the material that's already been presented, um, now would be a great time to enter those questions in the Q&A function below. Um, and we'll just continue on with some more of our uh, tips and tricks. So moving on to morning routines. 
Uh, now that we have all that great background information and knowledge from Kristen about how we can identify and teach our skills, we want to work our way through some of those examples, uh, things that we might want to try together in the next few weeks leading up to school. So, so we're going to start first with our morning routine. And if we think about mornings, I know for our family, mornings can often be a challenging time, and particularly for transitioning from a summer schedule that may have had less structure uh, into more of a, a challenging school routine. So it can be helpful to start practicing getting back into that routine a few weeks before school starts. Now is a great time to get started. You can look at creating a morning schedule together with your child by talking about, demonstrating, and practicing some of those things that you'll need to do each morning to prepare for school. So if we think about some of our common morning routines, they might include things like getting dressed, having breakfast, maybe some of those hygiene or self-care tasks, so brushing or combing hair, washing our face, brushing our teeth, or using the washroom. You can help your child to prepare a packed lunch or snacks and pack essential items in their backpack or school bag, uh, like we just talked about in our last example. We also want to think about transportation, so how your child's getting to school, whether it's taking the bus or if they're walking or riding a bike or uh, having a caregiver drive them to school. So once we consider all of those potential activities that we need to include in our morning routine, we can add these to a checklist or to a schedule. And we can also take pictures to use as reminders. So for example, you might want to post a picture of all the items that go into your child's backpack as a reminder of what items need to be included or you can create a video model for them to look at. There are also apps available uh, that can help you create a visual schedule uh, if your child responds well to apps on a smartphone or a tablet. And again, in those days leading up to school, you can practice this morning routine step-by-step. Step. So we'll go through some of these steps in a little more detail in our next section. And we can use this same morning routine when we're getting ready, as Kristen mentioned, for some of our exciting summer activities, such as a trip to the park. So Kristen's going to show us an example uh, of one of these one of these morning routines. So here's an example of one of the ways that we can demonstrate or display a morning routine. We have the written task analysis displayed on popsicle sticks and there's some positional prompts. So we didn't talk about that, but that's another way that you can prompt your child by having some of the items in a position that makes things easier. So the child needs to take their medication, um, eat their breakfast, get dressed, and every time they complete a popsicle stick, they can put that popsicle uh, stick in the yellow container. And then that's a way that you can collect data by um, counting how many items uh, or how many popsicle sticks were completed or, or end up in the yellow container. Um, and you can see with the positional prompts, like there's milk already poured, so the child just needs to pour that milk into the cereal. The meds are already prepped and ready. And so it's just a nice way to show how you might um, display a task analysis and have some prompts already ready for your child. Here's another example of visual cues or prompts that can assist your child in packing their backpack as part of a morning routine. So in the first picture, you can see a visual prompt with three items that the child needs to pack. In the next photo, the last item's covered up. So here we're starting to fade our prompts to give your child some opportunity to exercise their memory. And over time, when the child's successful and doing it on their own, we can continue to fade the prompts. In the last photo, you see two items are covered up. Um, ideally, you'd see another photo where all the items are covered up as well. Um, you can cater this to your child's unique items and you can um, write out the prompts or use photos or drawings. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Lots of us think of numeracy and literacy when we think of school. There's some more unspoken skills necessary for the classroom and attending is one of them. Attel attending helps us have a frame of reference and it helps us orient towards where the learning is going to happen. A lot of us are guilty of calling our children's name when they're at home, when it's time to come away from something that they like doing and time to come do something that's less fun. And oftentimes they also already have something that's um, rewarding or distracting to them, like a screen. A small but strong place to start with attending is before they get access to that rewarding item or that fun item or watching TV, playing with something, call their name. And then when they orient towards you, then that's when you give the item to them. So instead of calling their name for something less appealing, call their name, wait for an appropriate response, such as orienting their body or their face towards you, 
and then give them their favorite dessert or sing them a song they like or offer a preferred activity when they attend. Similar to calling their name, you can also do this for other attending cues like pointing um, or saying look and rewarding them for when they orient towards those responses. So dressing skills are another important part of our school routine. Dressing is not only part of our routine as we get ready for school, but students also need to develop that independence with dressing skills while they're at school. And if we think about what goes into getting dressed, that involves a combination of our gross motor skills, so things like body awareness, balance, coordination, and strength, as well as our fine motor skills, so how we're using our hands in terms of hand strength, dexterity, and coordination. When we're choosing our clothes, that involves higher order executive skills, so things like planning and problem solving. And we also need to have sensory awareness skills, which we call interoception. So that internal sense or awareness of our body temperature, whether we're feeling hot or cold, so we can plan what we're going to wear and have that correspond to what the weather's like. So if we want to get started, we can help our child to pick out maybe a few favorite outfits that are appropriate for school. And if your child's just starting to learn these skills, you might want to start with clothes that are pretty easy, things that are comfortable, they're easy to put on or take off. So we want to minimize things like zippers and buttons, those fasteners. Some examples might include things like leggings or jogging pants, and maybe a t-shirt or a sweater or a hooded sweatshirt. And if your child's school requires a school uniform, you might want to talk to your school to see if there's an option such as um, maybe wearing their athletic option with jogging pants and a t-shirt that might be more comfortable for your child um, than a typical school uniform. Again, we want to keep in mind any sensory sensitivities, things like tags or seams or fabrics that might be irritating or itchy. And if your child does well with predictable routines, you can practice by laying out their clothing the night before, or they may even want to set up a schedule or a rotation for certain clothing or favorite outfits. If it's possible and you can get duplicates of favorite items, that might save you from those panicky mornings where they can't find that one favorite shirt or that perfect pair of socks. I'm sure we've all run into that. To practice dressing skills in a fun or more motivating way, you can do things like putting on dress up clothes or trying on Halloween costumes. Um, or for younger children, they might like dressing their dolls or if they have stuffed animals, um, practice manipulating clothing while they're playing with their um, stuffed animals. Older children, on the other hand, might benefit from opportunities to practice changing from their regular school clothing into athletic wear or their gym clothes and having maybe a discussion around options for privacy if this is a concern. So, um, for example, maybe getting changed in a private stall or in a cubicle. And as you're getting into those cooler winter months, we want to allow more time to practice dressing in outerwear. So things like snow pants and jackets and hats and mitts. Um, and when we're allowing lots of time, then that can, we can make sure that that time is used as a learning time rather than feeling rushed. So we have a few examples Kristen's going to show us for our dressing skills. We've given some examples of task analysis for dressing. We thought it might be helpful to show some prompting and prompt fading techniques for dressing. So here are some shoes and in the first picture they are out, they're untied and they're open by a chair. So we have some positional and embedded prompts here. And as the individual demonstrates more accuracy and independence, we might look at fading those prompts and having those shoes back where they belong in the little shelf and maybe over time they're tied to. And then in the next example, we've got a shirt and pants, and you can see some positional prompts. So they are placed in a way that it's easy for the individual to just put it on with their arms going through and their head going through and the tag is to the back, as well as the pants are laid out on a chair in that first photo um, with the tag appropriately to the back. So it's easy for the individual just to sit down and put those pants on properly. Um, and then we can fade that to the floor where it um, the items are out, everything that the child needs, and maybe even one step further is over time, those items are in a dresser. So the individual needs to get everything um, out from where they belong. So moving on to our next skill, we're going to be talking about mealtime skills. So we want to think again about what types of skills are involved in practicing during our mealtime and how we can practice those skills. So first of all, we want to think about our food variety or our food repertoire, so the types and variety of food. And we can work together with your child to select a few favorite lunch or snack options. 
So the idea is that we want to ensure there's always an easy or our preferred items to make sure that your child has at least something that they're going to eat. Um, so they're getting enough calories for their busy days at school. Um, but we might also want to use this as an opportunity to offer a challenge or a non-preferred item. So just increasing that exposure to maybe a piece of fruit or a vegetable that your child's been curious about at home. And another skill we mentioned briefly in our uh, is our sensory awareness or our interoception, so that internal sense. Um, and that it's also involved in eating where we're thinking about how we're feeling, whether we're hungry or we're full. Um, so often during, again, those unstructured times in the summer or during a vacation, we might fall into more of a grazing style of eating. So we're kind of having access to those snack type of foods um, often throughout the day. Um, and unfortunately, when we're snacking often, we sometimes have a hard time sensing when we're truly hungry or when we're full. So in those days and weeks that are leading up to back to school, it might be helpful to time our meal times and snacks to correspond um, more closely with when our nutrition breaks might happen during the school schedule. So your child then can have the opportunity to have their meals and snacks spaced out more similarly to how they'll be presented at school. Um, and you can maybe add those meal times to your visual schedule, or if your child's interested in using a watch or a timer, then that lets your child know when they can expect their next meal. Um, as well, during meal times, we have the opportunity to practice our fine motor skills, so how we're using our hands, um, things like opening containers. Um, we've talked about that previously, uh, and we can work on serving their lunch or their snack in their school lunchbox or containers, even when we're at home, so they have some practice with opening containers. Again, we want to give lots of time to practice opening, um, things like removing lids, opening zippers. We want to practice refilling our water bottle. And if they struggle with any of these skills, um, we can also look for solutions that might work better for your child. So maybe an example is wrapping their food items in a paper towel or in a napkin or using a reusable food wrap until they're ready to open and close containers on their own. So here are some examples we have. Um, of things we might want to practice. So opening a thermos in the first picture. Um, similarly, we could open a refill, or sorry, refill a water bottle. So opening and closing the lid of your water bottle and practicing filling that up. Um, practicing opening small con containers. So here we have pictured a yogurt container or a small Tupperware. Um, and then we might also want to think about where we're going to store the waste or the garbage from their lunch. So many schools have what they call a boomerang lunch, where everything that goes to school is expected to be sent home again. Um, so it might be helpful to have a discussion and have a plan in place for how we want to deal with those um, messes of garbage. So maybe we include a small baggie for waste or a container that can double as a garbage container. So moving on to fine motor skills, I know often the academic skills we try to prepare our children for at school are connected to fine motor skills. So that's just a fancy way, again, of talking about how we're using our hands. And at school, there's often an expectation that children can use handwriting skills to express themselves. Um, so maybe they're doing creative writing tasks. Um, there's handwriting needed for completing math problems or for taking notes and tracking assignments. Um, and if your child is just starting to learn how to write or print or write, or if they struggle with their fine motor skills. Um, so some examples might be things like writing endurance, so being able to write for a long period of time, um, or legibility, which is being able to write clearly. So there's lots of fun and creative ways that we can practice um, building our strength and our coordination in our hands um, at home in the days and weeks leading up to school. So our first example um, is looking at how we can build the strength in our hands. Um, so again, we, we need to have those really strong hands when we're opening, doing things like opening a stuck container um, or if we're using our hands for a longer period when we're coloring or writing or printing or drawing. Um, so we can use Play-Doh or clay or there's even a product called TheraPutty that has various levels of resistance um, and there's lots of fun activities they can try working on to manipulate it in different ways. Another area we might, might want to focus on is our coordination and dexterity in our hands. So this means how we're using our hands together in a coordinated way. So for example, to complete a task like tying our shoelaces or fastening a button, we want to have both hands working together in a coordinated way. And one way to practice this skill is by threading beads onto a lace to make a bracelet. Um, for younger children or for kids who are motivated by food, you can try putting food, fruit loops onto a pipe cleaner. Um, or you can practice lacing through a sewing card. So again, using both hands together in that coordinated way. And beading and lacing is also great for building our grasping skills. Um, so we're using our thumb and finger together 
um, to create up that pincer grasp. Um, similarly, we can use tongs or tweezers, and when we're manipulating them, we're using the small muscles in our hands to pick up tiny items. Um, we can use beads or pom-poms, and as we're opening and closing the tongs and tweezers, we're kind of mimicking those same actions that we might use um, when we're holding a pencil or when we're opening and closing scissors. If your child really likes patterns and sorting, um, they can use tongs or tweezers to sort colored pom-poms or to sort small toys into categories or to follow a pattern. And even if your child is already writing or if they're not particularly motivated by writing uh, or printing letters, you can work on those same skills and help to re refine their accuracy and build endurance um, with paper and pencil activities. So things like coloring, you can set a timer and have them color um, for several minutes each day. Um, you can practice completing dot to dots or mazes um, or drawing with sidewalk chalk as you have pictured here. So for more information about fine motor skills, uh, we have linked in our resource section, Autism Ontario has a webinar, uh, or sorry, a webinar series that's included uh, in our resources section. For older students, if we're looking at fine motor skills, um, that might look a little bit different. It might look like practicing skills that we're using at school, such as unlocking a combination lock. Um, one way to practice this is by having the lock on a container with something fun inside. And other skills, again, that they might want to be practicing, again, are managing food containers, as we discussed previously, um, but also managing school supplies. So opening and closing binders, maybe uh, how they're using paper clips or staples, or opening and closing a pencil case or a pencil box. All great skills to practice. Uh, if we switch gears a little bit to look at outdoor play skills, including gross motor skills, we want to look at how we can prepare our children for that uh, less structured time during back to school. So maybe recess or outdoor play time. And regardless of your child's age, they might benefit from having a visit to their school's outdoor environment prior to the first day of school. You can visit that school park or playground with your child and explore together. So thinking about what their interests are and where they might end up playing outside. Maybe they might benefit from a more structured outdoor activity, um, which is something you can practice together, like following the leader through the playground, uh, or even creating a scavenger hunt for older students. So on the next slide, we have pictured um, some examples of what your, your child's school playground might look like. Um, and we want to again look at the playground structure together and maybe think about any safety concerns your child might not be aware of. So maybe a fall hazard or where the road traffic is, is in relation to the playground. Uh, in the picture on the right, you can see that this school has created a pathway to guide the children's play. So they've got a little roadway um, that kids can run on. And maybe that's something that you want to bring to your child's school team um, using sidewalk chalk or sidewalk paint to create a similar path. Again, just to add a little bit more structure and give your child a starting place when they're playing outside. You can also think about whether your child will have access to any outdoor equipment. So things like balls or hula hoops are great for, again, adding more structure and even practicing things like turn taking or social interaction. So speaking of those social opportunities and preparing that social aspect of school, there are a few things we can do ahead of time to help give our child an opportunity for an easier start to school. Uh, the first probably most straightforward is just thinking about whether your child will know anyone at school and if, if there's a way to connect with any of those other parents or children before school starts. So ideally, if you can reach out to another family before school starts and set up a time to meet, even if you're just spending a short time together on the playground at the school, that creates that sense of familiarity and again gives you sort of a starting point. And if it's not possible to set this up before school starts, uh, your school team can help to facilitate it, a connection with one or more students during the first few days. We'll also talk about um, some extracurricular activities uh, that might be offered by your school. So a great way uh, is looking at those topics of interest that might be uh, something that's an opportunity to connect with other students at your child's school. So whether your, your school offers extracurricular activities or school clubs, um, some examples might be a coding or robotics club or a Lego club. Um, and I know some schools also offer maybe social skills training. So again, that's a great way to build those connections with other children um, and a great way to build connections outside of their, their immediate peer group. We've included a link here to the community events page uh, here at Autism Ontario, which is another way to build those peer connections within your community, uh, even outside of your child's school. 
and our colleague Tracy has uh, been leading a workshop on social skills. Uh, so stay tuned for uh, more opportunities to register for that workshop. So unfortunately, we don't have time today to get into a full discussion about what we call executive skills or those higher level organization and planning skills. But we did think it was important to spend a little bit of time touching on a few points uh, as you and your child prepare for another school year. So previously, we demonstrated examples of the planning and organization, and we talked about using a visual schedule during our morning routine. Um, but we can also add step-by-step -step instructions into a to-do list or a task list. And that's what we have pictured here on the slide, even just using uh, a smartphone to create a task list or a to-do list. If your child uh, needs that to help refer back to as they're completing each task. And in the second part of this webinar series, uh, our colleagues Tracy and Danielle will be going into a little more detail about pro the process of communicating with your child's school and with their school team. Um, but today we just wanted to focus on helping your child develop more of these skills independently. So particularly from the perspective of having your child have their own voice and how they'd like to manage their experience with school. Um, whether that's communicating with their parents, with you, um, about what they need to bring home from school and take back to school, or whether that's communicating with their school team as well to track homework and assignments. So moving on to emotional skills and strategies. So when we're talking about our target skills and our goals for our child and our family, we also want to think about that emotional challenge of starting a new routine with back to school. So we can start talking about emotions in our home and normalizing our child's potential worries about going back to school uh, in those weeks leading up to back to school. For our younger children, we can use books and pictures to help them learn to identify uh, how they might be feeling. And older children might want to keep a journal or use art or digital media to represent their thoughts and feelings. Our colleague Danielle has been offering a workshop called the Feel Better Box as an opportunity to develop these tools for children experiencing anxiety. So you can stay tuned for details about dates and times for this workshop, as well as for a teen uh, workshop that will be offered this fall. Just a note about change and stress. For some individuals, change can be stressful. And it's important to remember that change is hard and individuals can express their discomfort in various ways. Over time, we usually become more accustomed to the changes that life brings. And you can start to see little changes um, in your children's resiliency and adaptability over time. I say this so that you remember to give yourself and your child that adjustment time and so that you try not to change too many things on a day that's tough as that can make things worse. Take your time, be supportive and monitor progress. If your data shows that things are not improving over time, then you can make a planful change. So on that note, we can also continue to practice strategies that might help with calming when your child is feeling overwhelmed or dysregulated. And we want to think about what works best for our individual child. So for example, we often talk about those traditional calming strategies. So belly breathing or meditations, mindfulness and affirmations. Uh, but depending on your child, some of those calming strategies might actually look more like using their sensory tools or having repetitive movement, movements or actions to help with calming. So some examples we can look at might be incorporating movement such as swinging or spinning and incorporating calming touch such as massage or deep pressure or using fidget tools. So being aware of what works best for your child and having the opportunity to communicate what works best for your child and these strategies to your child's school team is a great first step. Uh, you can find more sensory strategies in our last webinar series that was called Exploring the Senses, and that's also included in our resources section. We want to get back onto a sleep schedule or routine before school starts. So we've got a workshop on sleep called the No Sleep Club for those interested available in um, the resource section. We discuss the importance of setting a consistent bedtime and wake time so your child's body starts getting into a routine and that you can help your child get a sufficient number of hours of sleep per night. We talk about some day and nighttime activities that you can do to encourage good sleep, like limiting elect electronics two hours before bed. So keep in mind your framework for teaching. Think about what you want to teach. Maybe it's a bedtime routine. If so, let's break it down into smaller components using a task analysis and use prompting when needed for certain skills like dressing. Working calming activities into your bedtime routine can also help set the tone and cue your child to winding down. 
So as we wrap up this presentation, we wanted to take time to thank you for being proactive and helping your child to prepare for back to school. We know we've given you a lot of information to sort through and there's no expectation that you need to be trying all of these suggestions we've offered. Uh, and similarly, we have a lot of resources that are available um, from interactive workshops and recorded webinars to community organizations and articles. So we hope you know that there are many resources available if and when you need them. And you can always check back with this presentation later on in the school year. Uh, it will be recorded. So if you're looking for inspiration or next steps, please feel free to check back. So our final suggestion or recommendation for today is just to remind you that in those busy times leading up to back to school, it's okay to take time to just relax, connect, and have fun as a family. It's important to keep in mind what is your family like to do together. So maybe that's going for a walk in your neighborhood, or playing a board game, or listening to music, or even having a family dance party. Uh, if you're feeling super motivated, you can use those fun family favorites to practice a few of these new skills we just talked about. But it's also okay to just plan for a balance of rest and fun as you ease into the school routine. So thanks again for joining us. And be sure to register for part two of this series with our colleagues, Tracy and Danielle. And now we will have some time to answer your questions. Hi, everyone. So just a reminder that that content you just saw was our pre-recorded content from last year's webinar. And Kristen and I are here live with you today to answer any questions you might have uh, based on that content or any other questions you have. So we do have a few questions that have already been received in the chat and we will start with those. And then again, feel free to add your questions in the Q&A box on your screen and we'll try to get to as many as we can in the next few minutes. Uh, so Kristen, I know one of the parents was asking about how to facilitate school bus transport for kids. Do you have any suggestions there? Yeah, so what transportation might look like from student to student can vary. It might be a school bus, a van, or a taxi, or maybe a caregiver driving them. Um, and ideally, we would want to promote predictability and familiarity, maybe through practice or video priming, which is where you would show through video what this could look like. Sometimes people might want to use visuals or social narratives to help prime the individual to what this might look like. Um, but with schools only being open, um, typically a week before school starts, that can really limit your preparation time. And so what I would suggest is that week before school, getting in contact with the school and try to figure out what that looks like for your child, what the um, transportation vehicle will be, what the route will be, and try to communicate as best as you can what your child likes during their car rides or vehicle rides, what things might help them feel more comfortable, what things might make them feel uncomfortable, if it's a change in driver and if there's any way that they could communicate that with you. Um, next week, we have part two of this webinar series with our colleagues, Tracy and Danielle, and they're going to be talking about communication with your school team. And so I really think some things you can prepare for and some things you can't, but you can always communicate and try to get the dialogue going on um, what specific likes and dislikes and things that your child um, may need or uh, may not want. And so I think communication is probably um, the best that we can do in that situation because a lot of schools are not open until that week before. Thanks, Kristen. Yeah, and just a reminder, so there is a part two in this series, and I think that's actually Thursday. Um, so today's session on Tuesday, and then we have a follow-up on Thursday. So if you did register uh, for both of these sessions together, then you should have the link coming up for that as well. Uh, I know we have another family talking about uh, moving to a new school. So asking, what are some ways to help my child adjust to starting at a new school after a big move? And I think that would relate nicely or tie in nicely to some of the recommendations we were talking about, uh, about connecting with other families and visiting that school location um, prior to school starting. So if you are able to make a family trip to uh, the school grounds or the playground to just check it out or to have sort of a, a 
playtime at the school just to create that sense of familiarity, to create some new memories at this new school. Uh, and if there is an opportunity, like Kristen was saying, to reach out to your school team and find out if there's other families you might be able to connect with, uh, just to have that as a starting point. And sometimes during that week before school starts, teachers are in the classrooms preparing. Sometimes they might be open to giving a little school tour or a classroom tour. And so that week before school starts might be a good time to start communicating and to start building that familiarity. Uh, and folks are just asking me about these pre-recorded webinars. So they will be available uh, to view later. And I think they actually go onto YouTube as well. Um, so you can check out Autism Ontario's website, autismontario.com. Uh, and you can also look for Autism Ontario on YouTube. There is a channel there as well. I see a question here asking for more information on toilet training. Um, in the resource section, there is likely going to be a link to our toilet training webinar series. And we also have a toilet training guide. And so that um, should support you with some more information on various toileting uh, related skills and repertoires. Also, the webinar next week on communication with your schools will help you um, in terms of communicating where your child is at and what their needs are. Thanks, Kristen. So we do have a question around how do I make my child love going to school? Uh, so if you have a child that cries just at the mentioning of going to school, again, a lot of this ties into those conversations that you're going to have with the school team like Kristen was mentioning about what your child likes, um, maybe what things are challenges for them, um, and communicating with that team to sort of prioritize that, that maybe our first goal isn't about um, some of those other pieces around academics um, or even some of those social pieces. Maybe our, our main priority is just to make this a positive experience and something that they're looking forward to. So again, feel free to ask your questions in our Q&A function. And there are lots of resources available um, through our resource section, but we do also have Autism Ontario has a whole back to school um, resource package. So feel free to access that. Oh, I great. see a question in here. Sorry, Bethany. Yeah, I was just gonna say the link to the YouTube channel looks like it's going in the chat for us here. So that's great. So I, I see a question here. Is it more advisable to have my child go to the entry um, program first? I think they're talking about entry to school program instead of going directly to school for the first time. So that's challenging to answer without knowing um, specifics about the child's repertoire or specifics about what each of those entry to school programs has to offer. But I would suggest um, getting in touch with the entry to school program and asking what they can provide and seeing if that is a fit for you and your um, family. And sometimes it may be, and sometimes it may be not, but that's going to be a personal decision, but I would just encourage you to get more information. Okay. Great, well, thanks everyone for joining us today. I don't see a lot more questions here, but again, you're, you're free, please feel free to join us on Thursday for the second part of this presentation, which will be all about those conversations and communication with your school team. Uh, it looks like we do have one more question here, uh, working on target skills at school. So with transitioning between classrooms, um, maybe connecting with the resource teacher. Sorry. So I think this question is more about who's going to work on the target skill. So typically your child will have a teacher and that classroom teacher um, may delegate um, some responsibilities to a support staff. Maybe there will be a resource teacher. Every school team will kind of be different, but the teacher is your point person to ask those questions to. Um, as there might be some unique makeups in different school boards, different classrooms. Um, so next week's webinar on communication with your school team um, will probably outline a little bit more about uh, your school team, who to go to, who to ask for in terms of who's going to work on certain skills. But your teacher is typically, or your child's teacher is typically the point person and the first point of contact when you want to have those discussions about what um, the school year will look like going forward. Okay. 
Okay, pretty quiet group today. Any more questions? So thanks again for joining us. And this recording will be available uh, after the end of this presentation. And we will also have a feedback survey uh, that will be available to you. So if you do have some feedback about this presentation or suggestions for future topics, please feel free to add those into our feedback survey. Thanks again for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you on Thursday.